thank you for setting the stage for us for worship this morning. Uh, especially appreciate how God is sovereign, and a lot of times, uh, without a whole lot of communication, uh, the worship leaders find the right uh, worship music to set the tone for what's coming. I especially appreciate Dwayne's focus this morning, helping us to put right in the center of our thoughts the incredible mercy that we have received from God through Christ, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that we were fully uh, deserving of all the wrath that God could pour out because we were sinful, we were without excuse, and yet uh, God made us objects of mercy. Thank you, Stephen. I also appreciate uh, the, uh, the reference to opening up our hearts because uh, we were praising and worshiping God in song, and now we're going to worship God by devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching. This is just as much a part of our worship of him as we subject ourselves to the word of God. We come under its authority. We invite God to show us more of the things that are worthy of praising him, more of his glory as we study his word. And we also invite him to change us in his word through the power of the Holy Spirit. So all those things are going to be going on as we continue to worship him. Uh, but I need to ask for God's help before I try to lead us through that. Uh, would you pray with me? Dear Father, uh, you were so faithful to answer my prayer in the earlier service. Uh, you carried me through, and I hope and I pray that it was a uh, a blessing to those uh, that were here. And uh, God, I just confess to you again that I have no strength or wisdom of my own. And I just ask you to move me to the side. And Lord, that uh, you would speak your very word to us uh, with your strength for your glory. And I ask for all of us as we hear your word that we would be like Mary. Uh, God, we, we can often be like Martha and have a lot of busyness on our hearts and minds. We can often um, have even good things that we're thinking about that distract us from sitting at the feet of our Savior and listening, uh, just really holding on to every word from, from his mouth. God, give us that kind of heart. Uh, awaken our hearts this morning. Help us to be... Um, anticipating uh, truths to be coming out and, and latching on to those and help us to have hearts that are, are just like butter, Lord, that are melted before you that you can take and change. Uh, God, uh, we ask that as a result of our time of worship, we will leave here praising you more and living more for your glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, after having taken about an eight-week break from the study of the book of Romans, uh, we are going to restart Romans at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Howell concluded an eight-week uh, series of sermons that were so very helpful to me. And if you missed any of those, I recommend that you go back and, and view those online when they become available. But uh, uh, being the plagiaristic guy that I am, I want to grab some of the nuggets from those eight sermons because I think they have a lot of bearing on where we're going to be going today in Romans chapter 12. So um, among the key passages that were used were 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Ephesians 2, 20 through 21, and Ephesians 4, 13. In uh, not an offending sort of way, uh, Pastor Howell indicated that you and I are like bricks, that we are living stones, we are works in progress, and that we are being built into a spiritual house. And I love this whole concept of looking at the church 
as a building being constructed because it gives us a lot of key insights into the process of how God is building the church and how each one of us is being built up as well. So uh, one of the first things that uh, Pastor Hal pointed out is that the truth of God's word is the foundation that makes the church secure. We are being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the very word of God. And that is the rock, that is the foundation that makes us secure. Second, we are being joined together brick by brick, uh, and we're being aligned with, we're being trued up against that cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. He is the chief cornerstone. And third, we're built, being built up and we're moving toward unity and maturity. As Pat pointed out, this is both a uh, unity with God, that in our relationship with God, we are being built, in, built up. The integrity of our brick is being strengthened. Uh, we're experiencing individual growth. And also, we are being united with one another how we're being fitted and joined together in this structure. Um, and either one of those, uh, if the integrity of the individual brick is compromised, it can damage the church, the whole structure. If we're not well joined with one another, then we might actually kind of slip off to the edge and get out of alignment and jeopardize the strength of the wall. One of the things I wanted to kind of expand on was this idea of a building where God will dwell. And I want us to think not just of like the four walls that are around us and then we're inside the building. God dwells in his church. He dwells, he permeates, he radiates his glory in each and every brick and in the whole, the structure as a whole. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So Paul is reminding us that each brick is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and each of us has an individual responsibility to honor God with our bodies. We are being built up in integrity. This last eight weeks, the focus has been primarily on the building of the church. So we've mostly been focused on those bricks being joined together and maybe less so on the integrity of the individual brick. But as we look at Romans 12, one through two today, Paul has both of these in view. Um, so his appeal to us has both a corporate dimension what we are doing together here as a church, and an individual charge and a responsibility as we continue to move toward unity and toward maturity in the body of Christ. So with that in mind, let's get into our primary text for today. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you're thinking that, hey, this is uh, only two verses of Scripture, so it should be a pretty short sermon today, we should get out of here in time to go off to lunch, uh, you may adjust your thinking just a little bit. Uh, I bolded some key phrases in Romans 12, 1 through 2. Uh, I've been working on this for a long time, and I would say that at any given time, there was an entire sermon on just about every one of these bullets. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to preach all of those sermons, but what I've done today is try to condense down to the key thoughts. So what I'm offering you is one key takeaway uh, associated with each of these bolded items on the verse. So if you are a note taker, this is your outline. This is 
what you can fill out is your skeleton, and then you can fill it in as we go. So, without any further to do, to do let's begin with therefore, and it is uh, uh, imperative that every good Bible scholar, when he comes across the word therefore, has to say, what is the therefore, therefore? So, what Paul is doing here is, he is saying, in light of everything that has gone before, all of this foundational doctrine, uh, all these key truths of the faith that I have been teaching you in the first 11 chapters of Romans, here is the big so what. Romans 12, 1 through 2, is the turning point between Paul's exposition of the doctrines of faith, what we would call orthodoxy, and his instructions on how we live in response to those truths, orthopraxy. Paul uses a similar pattern in other books that he's written. For example, in Ephesians, he goes from doctrinal truth to practical application after chap chapter 3. So the first three chapters are primarily foundational truths. And then in chapter 4, he uses this phrase, now live a life worthy of it. Romans 12, 1 through 2 um, is more than just that turning point. It's even more than a, than a hinge. I thought about a hinge as a visual cue for this. Uh, but what I really settled on is this idea that Romans 12, 1 and 2 is a spiral. You know how you use those spiral notebooks back in, in school? Or maybe they don't use those anymore. But uh, anyway... It is a spiral that links together, on the left side, chapters 1 through 11, the truths that bring life to light, and on the right-hand side, chapters 12 through 15, life lived in light of the truth. So Romans 12, 1 through 2 is really where you and I, as followers of Christ, should live on a daily basis. We are constantly reaching into the truths, the basic foundational truths of the, of the doctrines of, sal of salvation, the gospel, and then we're trying to take those truths and apply them and walk out those truths in our lives. And then as we go through our lives, our daily lives, we're facing all kinds of situations, and in order to understand our lives, we're reaching back into that well of truth. So, without re-preaching the first 11 chapters of Romans, I still want to at least give you a quick bullet uh, summary of what, the, what that foundation looks like before we launch into chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. This is the foundation that Paul is building on, so I'm going to at least give you the key uh, frame members of that. So, first of all, chapter 1 we see, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. In chapter 1, we see that God's saving power received by faith is our only hope, because God's wrath is coming, and man is without excuse. In chapter 2, Paul gives us a little bit more detail on the kind of righteousness God is looking for. God is not just looking for external conformity to a code, but he is looking at an internal transformation by the power of his spirit that will result in a people who no longer live just for themselves or to please others, but who live to please God. This is a circumcision of the heart at the heart level. Then in chapter 3, we see the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ that yields for us a righteousness that is apart from works of the law. And then in chapter 4, we see the example of that presented in the life of the patriarch Abraham, and then Abraham's example applied to all of us. In chapter 5, we see that since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have gone from being enemies of God 
to being God's beloved. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Through Christ, we have been reconciled to God, and we have peace. In chapter 6, through faith in Christ, we who were formerly slaves to sin have died with Christ to sin. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, we have been raised to new life in Christ. We have victory over sin. In chapter 7, we learn that we are instruments of righteousness, but we're not instruments of righteousness by our own power to adhere to the law. We now serve in a new and living way by the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. In chapter 8, Stephen C. led us through what I would call a doxology of praise to God for all of the important, rich treasures that we have in Christ. And I'll just name a few. In Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We have new life through the Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us to raise us up to a new life in Christ. We have been adopted into God's family through Christ. We have an inheritance. We are heirs with Christ. And we are looking forward to a future glory with him that makes our present pain and suffering not worth comparing. And we have an unshakable hope that is absolutely secure because nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. In chapter 9, we're reminded that salvation is a gift from God according to his sovereign choice and for his purpose and glory. God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Praise God for that. Uh, we should never question God's fairness. We should only see that he has made us objects of mercy, and we should be very, very glad. In chapter 10, Paul takes some time to describe the response of faith that leads to salvation and to highlight the necessity of preaching the word. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. In Romans 10, 14 through 15, we see the progression. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom, of whom they have not heard? And then how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And then finally, in Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Finally, chapter 11. We are reminded in chapter 11 that the central character in the gospel is not you and I. The central figure in the gospel is God. It is God's plan of salvation, and it is beyond our understanding. We're not owed anything by God. It's all about how he has chosen to reveal his glory and to receive our praise. In chapter 11, beginning in verse 33, Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So in chapters 1 through 11, Paul has given us this vast treasure of truths. And now he leverages, he selects, he sums it up 
in one key takeaway to shape our attitude and to motivate us as we go forward. He reminds us of the incredible mercy that we have received from God. As creatures who have received and benefited from the mercy of our Creator, how ought we to live? What is the right response to such mercy? And this is something that I think we need to, to take time and, and often to just reflect on the mercy that we have received to let that frame how we approach life. Um, that I can think of at least two responses to this question in view of God's mercy, fill in the blank. One of them is provided in Romans 12, 1 through 2 by Paul. He says, in view of God's mercy, we should live a life that is yielded, a living sacrifice to God for his glory. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul writes, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In view of God's mercy, we should lay ourselves down as a sacrifice to him. That would be appropriate. That would be the right response to such mercy. But there's another way that this should work. In view of God's mercy, we should be the most humble the most thankful people on the planet, and we should be willing to extend mercy to others. We should not be like the unmerciful servant in the proverb that Jesus shared in, in Matthew chapter 18, whose debt was mercifully canceled and yet who refused to have mercy on the one who owed him. The mercy that we have received from God should flow through us and to others in such a way that exalts Christ. Living in view of God's mercy should shape our attitude. It should motivate us as we have Paul now beginning to instruct us in how to live in light of the truth that we have received. That is the basis of our motivation. It's the basis of our attitude in view of God's mercy. So, now that we've arrived at this point, in view of God's mercy... What is Paul going to ask us to do? So I want to go a little bit out of order with the, the, bullet, or the, uh, the bolded sections of the scripture because I want to draw our attention to a somewhat innocuous but what is really a very audacious phrase. This is your true and proper worship. Think about that for me. This is your true and proper worship. You know, we spend a lot of time trying to understand how is it that we worship God? You know, earlier this morning, we uh, were worshiping God through singing songs of praise that were calling out attributes of God and lifting those up and exalting him. And, uh, and that, that was certainly worship. But now Paul has the audacity to make this statement. This is your true and proper worship. So uh, you might imagine that when I got to this, I kind of camped out here for a while because I wanted to understand it. And that means that you need to bear with me as I take some little bunny trails to get around to the points that God uh, led me to as I, as I studied this. So here we are at Paul's juncture between the truths of the faith and the life of the faithful, and we find true and proper worship. It's a pretty well-known, kind of not a contradiction, but I would say a tension that exists between the truth of the gospel that salvation is by grace through faith and you are not saved by your works, but an equally important truth that faith without works is dead. Both of these statements are true. So uh, as we arrive with Paul at this point where he has laid the foundation, he's made this case that salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. He's gone to great pains to do that, but now Paul is going to ask us to do some works. So what is the basis? What is the relationship between 
the faith and the works of faith. And if we get that wrong, might we stray from the heart of the gospel? I believe that that is a danger. I think that some stray from the heart of the gospel by beginning to return to uh, a form of Judaism. They return to a works-based salvation. And I think that this is insidious. I, I think, you know, most people that you would talk to would not say, I believe my works save me, but subconsciously, they think that their works are somehow making them more worthy of salvation. And they look around them and they are bolstered in their confidence in their faith by comparing themselves to other people and their works. Well, this is not a gospel of grace. It is a false gospel. On the other end of the spectrum, we see others who are straying from the gospel by thinking that because I'm now under grace, not under the law, that as long as I profess faith in Jesus Christ, I'm his, I'm showing faith, it really doesn't matter how my life follows after that. That's immaterial. Or it's not important, at the very least. So this is kind of following the pattern of an early heresy in the early church, the Gnostic heresy, where basically only the spiritual was important, the physical was unimportant, and so, you know, eat, drink, party, and, and it will be fine because the spirit's fine. But that's false. It was called out back uh, in the early development of the church as a heresy, and, but it still finds some adherents unknowingly today. And I think there's another area where we miss the heart of the gospel that kind of falls between the two. And that is the person who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe that the death and burial, resurrection of Christ as the Son of God is sufficient to, uh, to free them from the power of hell, to save them from hell but they don't believe that that same power that raised Christ from the dead is sufficient to change their lives. And so they live a defeated life that doesn't bring much glory to God, and it does not bear much fruit. Um, at the very least, I would say that's a diluted form of the gospel. So with all these ways to go wrong, uh, they're, they're not new. Nothing's new under the sun. Paul faced this. Uh, he battled these heresies uh, in trying to shepherd the early church, and they are alive and well for us today. So if salvation is about God's grace and not my works, why are my works still so important? It's important for us to be able to answer that question well so that we don't stray from the gospel. And I think the Bible gives us many reasons for that, many answers to that question. So while our faith does not contribute one iota, or while works of faith, while our works, our good works, do not contribute to our salvation, they are critical for many reasons. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. God has demonstrated his love for us. How is it that we demonstrate our love for God? The proper response to the love that we have received is to love God. But how do we show that love? We demonstrate our love for God by obeying his commandments. This is a very reasonable, gospel-centered uh, explanation for why our, our obedience to God's commandments is so very important. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul writes, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Uh, many times we will say, well, what is the chief purpose of man? The chief purpose of man, the reason God created him, was to glorify God. And here Paul reminds us that when we live according to God's commandments, we live for his glory. That's a great motivation. In James 1.27, James writes, Religion 
that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Our works and our behavior matter to God as acceptable, pure, and faultless religion. To some extent, they're an extension of his work. It does matter. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We see that our works of faith testify that we're really saved. What we do, how we respond to the gospel, what we see, the changes in our lives, all these things are helping to show us that we truly belong to God, that we truly have regenerated hearts, that we are responsive to God. But Romans 12, 1, I think, provides us yet another reason, and this might come to a surprise as some. How we live out the gospel is central to our true and proper worship of God. After establishing this whole basis of our faith apart from works, Paul is getting ready to urge us on into some works, and in the center of what Paul urges us to do is this phrase, this is your true and proper worship. So I took a little bit of time here and did some scholarly work. I looked up the, the, uh, the Greek root words that are being translated here uh, as true and proper worship. Uh, it is logikos latria. Logikos meaning rational, logical, reasonable, of the word or of the logos. And latria meaning ministration of God, worship, divine service. So when you put all that together, the King James would say it's your reasonable service. NIV says this is your true and proper worship. ESV says which is your spiritual worship. The bottom line is this is an important way that God is showing us that he wants to be worshiped. Earlier, we were worshiping God by singing praises to him, and I believe that that was true and proper worship. Now we're worshiping God by submitting ourselves to the instruction of his word. We're seeing, hopefully seeing more of his glory so that we can praise him even more. And we're being changed by what we're listening to. The Holy Spirit is taking this and changing us. And that, I believe, is true and proper worship. But I want to draw attention in particular to what this is Paul referring to here in Romans 12, 1 through 2. So I did a little bit of uh, English grammar work here. The pronoun this or which, whichever translation you look at, that pronoun is sandwiched between double antecedents. Uh, for you non-English teachers, that means that anytime you see that, or in this case, where you see that this, you could replace it with one of two items, and both are true. So the double antecedents are, number one, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You can put that in place of a this. And you should include an and because it is both. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Those two phrases are what he's referring to when he says this is your true and proper worship. So let's tackle one at a time. We'll start out with living sacrifice. It shouldn't surprise us that part of worshiping God involves sacrifice. Following Christ from the very beginning has been a way of sacrifice and self-denial. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When we used uh, Pat's illustration earlier of the church as a building being built up. Uh, you could almost envision the master bricklayer. He's selecting the brick and he's examining its integrity and he's preparing it with just the right mortar in the right places and he is fitting it into place and ensuring it is secure and it's true in the wall. This picture is similar to the way that we as those bricks, those individual 
uh, Christians are being built into the church, the body of Christ. And our integrity is important. Our placement in the wall is critical to the overall health of the building. But there's a little catch here. We're a particular kind of stone. We're a particular kind of sacrifice. As living stones, as living sacrifices, we're subject to sliding off the altar of sacrifice, becoming unwilling to deny ourselves, putting ourselves first, taking ourselves out of the place that we were put. So if, if we're not willing to deny ourselves, if we're not joined well with mortar, leveled, true, in good alignment with the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, we could slip off. The thing is, I think sometimes we think, well, I've given my life to Christ. Uh, he opened my heart. He helped me to see the truth of the gospel. He drew me to himself, and I have surrendered to him. I belong to Christ. I've given my life to him. But it's not a one and done. It's not a one-time thing. Part of our true and proper worship of God is a continual laying down of ourselves, submitting ourselves to God. So when we do this, our worship of God becomes not so much self-actualization like we kind of see today where, you know, I'm being built up and more of me is coming out, but it's really more of God coming in and through us uh, so that we can be a sacrifice, content to be laid down where he's placing us, willing to deny ourselves and to follow him. And we are in agreement with John the Baptist. Remember when he uh, was seeing his ministry declining and every, the limelight was going to Christ, and he said, he must become greater, I must become less. This kind of sacrifice is something we have to do every day. Um, Paul saw that in the Macedonian church, and he commended it in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. He said, and this, he was surprised. He said, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. This process of continually giving ourselves to the Lord is part of our true and proper worship. The other half of the this is being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Um, this is going to date me a bit, but there is a song that, uh, that I used to enjoy hearing by Harry Chapin called The Cats in the Cradle. Is there anybody at all who even recognizes that song? Okay, a few in my age group. So it is about this young son whose dad is always busy with other things. The son is always eager to spend time with his dad. He's always saying, when you coming home, dad? When you coming home? His dad is his hero, and he excitedly tells his dad, I'm going to be like you, dad. I'm going to be like you. So for this boy, he is really kind of worshiping his dad. His imitation of his dad is the highest form of praise that he can give. And I think it is true that the one that we most want to be with and to be like, that's the one that we are giving worship to. Now, the only one who's worthy of our worship is Christ. And when we desire, when we truly desire to be transformed into the image and example of Christ, to become more and more like him, we are worshiping him in a way that is pleasing to God. Now, transformation is only true and proper worship if we are being transformed into the image and example of Christ. And Paul contrasts this by telling us not to be conformed to the pattern of the world. Uh, when my children were younger, I used to, to tell them that uh, being a believer and living out there in a fallen world is kind of like being on a people mover at an airport, only it's taking you aware, away from where you want to go. It's taking you away from God. And so you can't just 
stand your ground, you have to intentionally turn toward God and exert yourself to move toward him because left to yourself, you're going to be carried further and further away from God. That's kind of the way of our fallen world, and it's the way of our sin nature as well. So more recently, as I get older and I have spent more time struggling in this struggle myself, I'm changing my illustration from being a people mover to being trying to go up the down escalator. I mean, it's really, it's really work. And you're, well, every once in a while, it feels like you're going to take a tumble. Um, the word that Paul uses here for transformed is metamorphuste. And it's the same word, if you look at the account of Jesus' transfiguration, it's the same word that's used there. So in other words, Paul is talking about a dramatic change here, a very dramatic change. But in all honesty, there are some days when I look at myself in the mirror and I still see a lot of the old self. There are some days when I look in the mirror and I don't see much of anything that resembles Christ. And it's easy to, to get a little discouraged at times. Um, fortunately, the truth is we are being transformed into the image and example of Christ, but this is a process. It's a process of growth that will last our whole lifetime. And there are many scriptures that God gives us to try to encourage us in this process of being transformed uh, to become more and more Christ-like. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Anyone who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who's surrendered their lives to him, has already been clothed with Christ. Christ is there. He didn't just go away after you put your faith in him and say, okay, good luck, live your life. He is with you, and his presence and his impression, his example, they are already beginning to form you, even as a very young Christian. Now, this process will continue as more and more you peel off layers of the old self, and more and more you are clothed in Christ. But... It's there from the very beginning. You have put on Christ if you are a follower of Christ. In Ephesians 4.15, it says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. In Ephesians, Paul is telling us this is God's plan. This is plan A, that you will become more Christ-like, that you're going to grow up into him in every way. So this is God's plan. He's in this. He's doing this. In Philippians 2.5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, imitating the way that Christ thinks. Literally, as we grow as Christians and we see more and more of Christ's character, the mind of Christ in Scripture, we should be latching onto that and imitating it that. We are to imitate Christ more and more as we, as we learn more and more about him. In 1 John 3, 2, John writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is a process, but it's leading to an end. Um, take hope. We will get there. We will see Christ, and we will be transformed fully. We will be like him. So how does God transform us? Paul gives us the answer right there in the very next thing, by the renewing of your minds. This is very central to our transformation. The renewing of our minds springs from continually submitting ourselves to the authority of Scripture, to count them as true, and to yield our wills to that truth. In a similar way to the church, we are being built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, the word of God, which is taking the example of Christ and it's extending it to our lives. So it is truing us up with Christ. God's word is doing this work, making us more Christ-like, and the Holy Spirit is tending that work. 
I remember when our children were participating in VBS, and some of them are here now, so they can check me on this. The kids did a program that was called Roman Through Romans, and I think it was our son Daniel, our oldest son, who had to dress up in a robot, robot costume, so he had this, this cardboard box painted kind of a glittery silver and his arms out and his head sticking out the top, and, and he had to memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. That was his line in the program, and I, I still have that robotic voice in my mind. You know, I can still picture that. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a good way to memorize scripture. <laughs> Get something like that, it'll stick with you. So, you know, this was a very lighthearted romp that popped from one of the major uh, familiar verses in Romans to another, and the kids enjoyed it. They had a fun time. But that's not the pattern that I would recommend for you in order to experience transformation. I believe that we have to be intentional, that we have to take time to study the verses in context, working from one passage to another, meditating on the Word of God. If we don't take the renewing of our minds seriously, instead of being transformed, we will be conformed to the pattern of this world. That's the default position on our little robot. And it's, it's our sin nature for every one of us. It has been said that we can teach some by what we say. We can teach more by what we do, but we teach most by what we are. And I believe uh, in my walk with Christ, I've, I've decided that we really ought to add a, a fourth one to that. We teach even more by whose we are. So as we continue to study the book of Romans together, I want to issue you a little challenge. I'd like to challenge you to make this a more intentional study of God's word not roaming through Romans, but being transformed by the renewing of your minds in what you say, in what you do, in what you are, and in whose you are. As we encounter the truths that are foundational to the gospel, I want you to make sure that you really fully under understand that bedrock foundation so that you can speak the truth in love. As you encounter admonishments like, I urge you then, brothers, when you come across things like that, I want you to intentionally look at your life. Put yourself uh, into the, under the microscope and see if there's anything that you are doing that needs to change in order to align with that admonishment. As you see more of Christ's character, work hard to imitate it in your own life so that you can become more like Christ and always be open, praying and seeking scriptures that will bring conviction for you, scriptures that will strengthen your faith and enable you to submit more and more of yourself to Christ to become more and more his. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul closes the second verse with the consequence. What can we expect when we worship God by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice and by being transformed by the renewing of our minds then what? He says, then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, people are all over the map in terms of how they look at this idea of God's will. Some people 
make it their life's quest to know the broader will of God. Where is God going with all of this? I want to understand kind of the mind of God and where is he taking us? Others are content to focus more. They come to some point, some decision in their life, some juncture, a fork in the road, and, and so they seek, what is God's will in this situation? Um, I have been both of those places at various times. But I think right now I find myself uh, relating better to Al Mohler, who shared that 95% of God's will is right here in black and white in the Word of God. Perhaps the clearest example of that that I can find is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 18. <clears throat> so in that passage, and you can even look above that and below that, it's a long string of attributes, traits, character traits that Paul is stringing together to describe this is the transformed believer. This is the end game. This is where you're going with this transformation. This is what it's supposed to look like. And at the very end of that string, he makes the statement, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. As we worship God by laying down our lives as a sacrifice, and we are transformed in the image and the pattern of Christ, the chief cornerstone, we test and approve what God's will is by doing it. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus that you be conformed to the example of his son, and you are proving that out. And it is good, perfect, and pleasing. I want to close today's sermon with a little teaser for what's coming up in Romans 12 through 15. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder, but I just want to throw a few things out there uh, that are coming up. We've got all this foundation of the gospel, all this truth from which to build our foundation. Now, what are we going to do with it? Well, in view of God's mercy, we should be the most humble people on the face of the earth. We have been served by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we not learn to be a people who can serve others? We have received a gift of unmeasurable value. Can we not be generous and hospitable to one another? If we are truly more than conquerors in Christ, can we not face with courage whatever adversity comes? If we truly believe that God is sovereign, we should be willing, even when it's tough, to submit to authorities as those who have died to sin and who are no longer slaves to it, we should be able to live moral lives. God has demonstrated his own love for us. Can we learn how to love and bear with our neighbor? Romans 12, 1 and 2 is where we live every day. We are in the spiral of learning more truth and putting that what we learn into action. Understanding the truth and applying it to our experiences and under, understanding our experiences in light of the truth. And provided we continue to offer our bodies as living sacrifices and we don't wriggle off the altar, by renewing our minds, God will continue to transform us and to make us more like Christ. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord, acceptable and pleasing to God. This is your true and holy and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the rich truth of your word. I thank you and praise you that Paul has used the first 11 chapters in Romans to give us a very clear picture of the gospel to understand that we are objects of your mercy. 
Lord, uh, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that we were facing the full wrath of God, justly so, because we were guilty as sin. Lord, uh, uh, you placed that wrath on your own son. You sacrificed him to atone for our sin. Thank you, Father, for this truth that we are objects of your mercy. Help us to learn to live in view of that mercy. And God, I pray that you would help us to worship you by daily laying down our lives as a sacrifice to you and by diligently renewing our minds that we might be transformed more and more into the example of your perfect son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.